السلام عليكم ورحمة الله الله أكبر 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 الحمد لله جليل الأكبر الذي لا راد لما قدر ولا دافع لما أراد من نفع أو ذر خالق الجن والبشر ورافع السماء بغير عمد ينذر أحمده في الأسائل والبكر حمدا عدفه به السوء, به السوء والدرر ونؤمن بالدارين بكتبه ورسله وبالقدر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ولا ذنب له ولا ملجأ من دونه ولا مفر أحد فرد سمد ليس له صاحبة ولا ولد بل تعالى فقدر وأشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد عبده ورسوله وسفيه وخليله سيد الخاص ولب الخير بعثه الله نبيا ورسولا واستفاه وليا طاهرا عربيا مشرفا معذبا قراشيا صاحب المجد الأثر والجبين الأزهر وخص في الشفاعة الأذمى في المحشر اعلموا أن يومكم هذا يوم عظيم وعيد مبارك كريم يوم العيد ويوم الوعيد عيد للأبرار ووعيد للفجار وعن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أنه قال لم يزل سومكم معلق بين السماء والأرض إلى أن أحدكم بؤدي زكاة سومه كما جاء في الخبر وعليكم بسيام ستة أيام من شوال متوالية وغير متوالية قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم من سام رمضان واتبعه بستة من شوال فكأنما سام الدحر كله وزينوا بواتنا بواتنكم بالتوبة كما زينتم ذواهركم بالملابس وتذكروا باجتماعكم على هذا اليوم المحشر After praising Allah and declaring our faith in Him and declaring the messengership of Rasulullah <laughs> and mentioning a handful of His unlimited exalted characteristics, I remind us that today is the day of Eid, it is a day of celebration but also for some a day of warning. And for all of us it should be a day of reflection. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in the Qur'an itself, A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajeem, Shahru Ramadan al-ladhi unzila fihi al-Qur'an. That this is the month, the Ramadan, in which the Qur'an was revealed. هُدًا للناس وَبَيِّنَةٍ مِنَ الْهُدَى وَالْفُرْقَانِ It is a guidance for mankind and a clear proof of itself through its guidance as well as a criterion 
to choose between what is good and evil or what is good and bad or what is right and wrong. So this is the month of the Quran and the Quran in reality is a conversation between Allah and His Messenger <laughs> and then through Him to the rest of us. And in that conversation it also lays out various courses for us to take. It is a syllabus for our life. You know, when you look at a syllabus course or, or a course book from a university, it lays, it, when it mentions a course, it also mentions the prerequisites for that course. The who is to take this course. What are the requirements within the course? And then what you should achieve if you complete the course. So what are the expectations as far as what you need to do? And what should you expect to get out of it? And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He commands fasting, verse 183 of Surah Baqarah, He says, Ya ayyuhal amanu. So the verse starts off with the prerequisite. That, O oh, you who have iman. Not for everyone. And iman, without going through a long derivation, iman in Islam is the love of Allah and His Messenger. Sallallahu alayhi wa and a love that should be unyielding and should surpass everything else. There is no Iman unless the love is at a level where we love Rasulullah above ourselves and everything else in creation. So this is the one whom the Course is for. Then he says, كُتَبَ عَلَيْكُمُ السَّيَامُ كَمَا كُتَبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ that fasting has been ordained or has been made an obligation upon you as it was for those before you. Even though this was modified through His mercy, that we don't fast exactly the way the previous nations fasted, but still, you know, the way we fast is an obligation upon us. And then in the end, He says, لَعَلَّكُمْ تتقون. So that you may attain taqwa. So the purpose or what we should expect to attain from the fasting, if we do it properly and we meet the requirements, is that we should have taqwa. And taqwa of course is defined, various people translate in various ways, piety, righteousness, God-fearingness. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself in the Qur'an defines it. And of course, the objective of everything in Islam is something from the heart. Qalbun yeah. Salim, that pure heart. The superficial things don't matter. You know, even when we declare our faith, we say, Iqrarun bil lisan wa tasdiqun bil qalb that I declare this with my tongue, but I affirm it or I testify it to, to it with my heart. And he says in Surah Hajj, ذَلِكَ وَمَنْ يُعَذِّمْ بِشَاعِرَ اللَّهِ فَإِنَّهَا مِنْ تَقْوَ الْقُلُوبِ That those who honor or respect the signs of Allah, this is from their taqwa of their hearts, the piety of their hearts. Everything in the universe is a sign of Allah. But certain signs stand out above other signs. You know, as he mentions, Safa and Marwa, or the Kaaba or those animals for sacrifice. But the interesting thing is when we look at all of these things, all of them in reality point toward Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he is the one who is the true sign of Allah, the greatest sign of Allah. 
So everything that we think of is everything Allah SWT created for Him, for His Beloved. And He created His Beloved for Himself. But here also He doesn't testify to this taqwa. He simply says that this is taqwa of the heart. In Surah Adab or Surah Hujrat, Surah number 49, he says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَغُدُّونَ أَسْوَاتَهُمْ عِنْدَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ وَلَائِكَ الَّذِينَ امْتَهَنُ اللَّهُ قُلُوبُهُمْ لِلتَّقْوَى لَهُمْ مَغْفِرَةٌ وَأَجْرٌ عَظِيمٌ That indeed those who lower their voices before the Messenger. Which means what? It means that those who humble themselves before the Messenger. Those who honor and defend the honor of the Messenger. <coughs> These are the ones, he says, that I have tested their hearts for taqwa. I have certified their hearts with taqwa. And for them is forgiveness and a great reward. Amen. So if simple logic, if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. If the purpose of Ramadan, of fasting and going through all of these exercises in Ramadan and staying awake at night and everything else that we do, is to attain taqwa, and Allah SWT defines taqwa as humbling yourself and honoring and defending the honor of Rasulullah then the whole purpose of all of these exercises is that we learn to humble ourselves before the beloved of Allah, to defend His honor and to honor Him. And if we have not achieved this in Ramadan, then we've gone through the exercises without meeting our goal. The more interesting thing is that Allah SWT through His mercy has sent people who have fulfilled this right and have sent them as an example for us. And He says about them in, in, his, in the Quran, رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُمْ وَرَضُوا that Allah is pleased with them and they are pleased with Him. And He sent them as the companions, as a gift to Rasulullah And if we look at the way they honored Him and defended His honor from the beginning, we can divide the life of Rasulullah in two parts, the Bakkan period and the Medinan period. We look at the Meccan period. After Hamza and Umar radiallahu when they became Muslim and Quraysh saw that Islam was gaining strength, so they came with an ultimatum. Hand him over to us or else. And the or else was boycott, complete and utter boycott. So the Muslims were isolated in a small valley and this went on for three years and for those three years they survived off of leaves and leather and whatever else they could scrounge and to understand this Sa'ad bin Abi Waqas who was one of those who was in this boycott he says one night he went to go out and relieve himself and as he was walking something crunched And he looked down at his old dry piece of camel skin. So he picked it up and took it home and washed it real well. And then he cooked it. And that was his food for the next three days. They went through all of this, but they did not yield in honoring and defending the honor of Rasulullah. Sallallahu Some of them even passed because of, of the starvation. And shortly after the boycott was lifted, the uncle of Rasulullah Hazrat Abu Talib radiallahu as well as his wife Bibi Khadijatul Kubra radiallahu ta'ala anha, 
both of them within a few days of each other passed because of the effects of the starvation that they suffered for these three years. But again, they did not give up or yield in the face of the oppression in defending the honor of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And many of us, we think, oh, the Medinian period was easy. But in Aqaba, when the deal was being made with the people of the Ansar, with the people of Medina, that they would take Rasulullah to their, to their city and defend him. The uncle of Rasulullah Abbas, who was the only non-Muslim who knew, knew of the meeting, he came to them, to the Ansar, and he said that you're going to take my nephew, and this is all fine. But understand what you're getting into. If you do this, then you will take upon yourselves the animosity of all of Arabia. And your crops will fail. Because they were farmers. He said, your crops will fail. Your heads will be separated from their bodies. Your women will become widows and your, and your children will become orphans. So they came to the Rasulullah and said, your uncle is telling us this. And he says, he tells you the truth. So they asked, they said, and what will we get in return for this? And he said, Jannah. But this isn't the deal maker. That's not what they were looking for. They said, that's fine. Jannah is fine. But our issue is that after all of this becomes yours, after all of Arabia falls to your feet, then you will leave us and go back to your people. And he says, no. He says, my blood is your blood and my life is your life. And I will live amongst you and I will be buried amongst you. And then they said, now, then that's fine. That's all we want. <coughs> You know, they were living, willing to give up everything. But they were not willing to give up Rasulullah. And even when he came to Medina, exactly this happened. And the companion said that they never ate with their stomach full until after Khaybar. Which is seven years after the immigration of Rasulullah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They went through all of this for the honor of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because they also understood, Allah Subhanahu Wa says in the Quran, وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوِ وَنَقْسِمْ مِنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ And surely we will test you with something of fear, hunger, loss of wealth, loss of your lives, and the loss of your offspring. But glad tidings to those who are patient. And they also understood that with difficulty comes ease. And again Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala emphasizes that indeed with difficulty comes ease. And we forget we want the ease but we don't want the difficulty and this is not the sunnah of Allah. If you want the ease you have to go through the difficulty. And this is a lesson that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala teaches us even as we enter this world. You know, we live in a fool's paradise that we think, oh, we can have the ease without the difficulty. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala has put both of them together. You cannot separate them. This, of course, is another Ramadan with Corona. You know, it's interesting. Uh, there's a thing going around on, on social media where Sudesh, one of the Imams in Makkah, you know, he's doing this dua, oh Allah, you know, crying that, oh Allah, take away the Corona. 
take away the corona and he's crying how can Allah answer this dua you know, crying over corona never shed a tear for the children of Yemen or the children of Sham Rasulullah Sallallahu one day he said, Oh Allah, send your blessings upon our Sham. And oh Allah, send your blessings upon our Yemen. And there are some people from Najd who said, Oh, yeah, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi also pray for Najd. And he again repeated himself. And they again repeated their question or their request. And he says, how can I pray for Najd? This is a place of fitna, of turmoil, of earthquakes. And he says, this will be the, ri the rise of Qarna Shaitan. Qarna is era. It can also mean horn, but in reality, in here, in this place, it means era, the era of Shaitan. Which is the era that we are living in. From the time that the Najdis took over Hijaz, this is the era of Shaitan. For those who don't know, the center of Najd is, is Riyadh. So the Najdis are bombing Yemen and bombing Sham. Because Rasulullah refused to pray for them. It's interesting, you know, there are people, you talk to them about this and they say, oh, these are things that are, you know, Rasulullah has already told us, these are things going to happen, so they're going to happen. We just need to look at our first, after ourselves. This is the attitude of a hypocrite. If you are part of this Ummah, Rasulullah has said that the Ummah is one body, and if any part of it is in trouble, then the whole body hurts. So if we do not feel anything for those being oppressed, then we're not part of the Ummah. You look throughout the world, whether it's Myanmar or Kashmir and, and Palestine, and now we're seeing the, the scenes in Palestine and now we're all in, up in arms. It's been going on for 70 years. Same thing in Kashmir. No, this isn't anything new for them. We think that, oh, because we're not going through it, no one else is going through any issues. Everything's fine. These things are going to happen, and they're going to get worse. And Rasulullah has told us this already, in very in, in significant detail. But he's telling us this wasn't to make us complicit or complacent. He told us these things because there are many, there are many lines in the sand these days. We need to know which side we're standing on. Are we condoning the actions of the oppressor simply by saying, staying silent? Or even outright praising them? Or do we stand with the oppressed? Because if you look throughout the world, the oppression against the Muslims is simply because they say Muhammad or Rasulullah. If they had been any other monotheistic religion, this wouldn't be happening to them.
And that's the problem, though, is that we think of them as them. We don't think of them as us. <coughs> the other aspect of why the dua is not accepted. Because in Islam, there is no dua. And there is no tawbah without the wasila of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And this is something that Fir'aun and his followers knew. Even they knew this. And yet the Muslim of today, because the era of shaitan, you know, when the Wahhabis spread their fitna throughout the world, because of this era of shaitan, we don't even understand this anymore. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, Surah Araf, Surah number 7, verse 134, he mentions after, you know, when he set the plagues upon the people of Egypt, the wholesale death, the locusts, the lice, the frogs, the blood. What would Pharaoh and his people do when, when these punishments came, when the plagues came? They would go to Musa al -Islam, And they would say, Ya Musa, Ya Musa, Dolana, Rabbaka. That, O oh, Musa, salam, invoke on our behalf your Lord. But they didn't stop here. They will say, Bima ahada indak. Bima ahada indak. La in kashafta anna rishsa. La nukminanna ka. La nukminanna laka. Wala nursilanna ma'aka. Bani Israel. First they will say, invoke your Lord upon our, our, our behalf. But then they will specify how to invoke him. And we'll come back to this part. And then they'll say, and if you remove this plague from us, if you, Musa al -Islam, remove this plague from us, then we will believe in you and we will free the children of Israel and let them go with you. But he wouldn't. And Allah SWT didn't say, oh, they committed shirk. Because he said, oh, Musa, you removed this plague. But again, they specified how to remove the plague, how to ask his Lord. Bima ahada, bima ahada induk. By that covenant, by that promise that he made you. You look through the Quran, what was the promise? What was the ahad? What was the covenant that was taken? And we find that in Surah Al Imran, verse 81. وَإِذْ أَخَذَ اللَّهُ مِيثَاقَ النَّبِيِّينَ لَمَا عَتَيْتُكُمْ مِنْ كِتَابٍ وَحِكْمَةٍ ثُمَّ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مُصَدِّقٌ لِمَا مَعَكُمْ لَتُؤْمِنُ النَّبِيِّ وَلَا تَنْسُرُنَّ And remember, when Allah took the covenant from the prophets, all of them, that we give you a book, we give you the book and wisdom, meaning we give you prophethood. Then comes to you, Rasulum, this exalted messenger, who testifies with, with, to what you have with you. Then you believe in him and render him help. So the covenant was about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, And all of them believed and accepted it. And all of them fulfilled this command by telling their people about the coming of Rasulullah. Sure. So even the, the, the people of Fir'aun knew this. And they said, invoke your Lord on that covenant, on that promise. And again... How can Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept these du'as when there is no wasila of Rasulullah? <laughs> Even Adam al Islam wasn't forgiven until he gave that wasila. 
and we think, oh, we don't need him. We go to Allah direct. And we see what we see what's happening now. But the best news that the companions ever received was when the companion he asked the Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, when is the hour? And Rasulullah answered this important question with a crucial question. He said, and what have you prepared for it? <coughs> the hour is when it's going to be, but what have you prepared for it? And he says, Ya Rasulullah, I don't have a lot of salat in my account, or a lot of fasting, or a lot of zakat, or charity. But I love Allah and His Messenger. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Rasulullah Sallallahu says, Then why do you worry? Al maru ma? Al maru ma'a? Man ahab. That the lover will be with the one that he loves. So for the lovers, this is great news. But what, boil, what it boils down to is, are we truly lovers? Do we love him as he should be loved? Do we defend his honor as it should be, on, as it should be defended? Do we love him above everything else, including ourselves and our families and our wealth and everything else that exists? Or are we like everybody else? That we just... Think of ourselves. <coughs> and if we haven't learned to honor and love Him, then we gain nothing from this Ramadan. You know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us you know, may He give us the gift of the love of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May allow us to love himself and to love his beloved and those whom he and his beloved love. الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ, بال... ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يحد الله فلا مذل له ومن يذلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن الله وملائكته يسلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا سلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد بعدد من صلى وسام اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد بعدد من قاد وقام وصلى الله عليه وعلى جميع الأنبياء والمرسلين والملائكة المقربين والخلفاء الراشدين خصوصا على خير البشر بعد الأنبياء بالتاقيق أمير المؤمنين أبي بقر الصديق رضي الله تعالى عنه وعلى مزين المنبر والمحراب أمير المؤمنين عمر بن الخطاب رضي الله تعالى عنه وعلى كامل الحياة والإيمان أمير المؤمنين عثمان بن عفان رضي الله تعالى عنه وعلى مذهر الأجاب والغرائب أمير المؤمنين عثمان بن وأمير المؤمنين علي بن أبي طالب كرم الله وجه ولا الإمامين الهمامين السيدين الشاهدين أبي محمد الحسن وأبي عبد الله الحسين 
رضي الله تعالى عنهما ولا أمهما سيد 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 النساء فاتمة الظاهرة رضي الله تعالى عنها ولا أمهما كان بين بين الناس أبي عمارة الحمزة وأبي فضل العباس رضي الله تعالى عنهما وعلى الستة الباقية من الأشهة المبشرة وسائر وسائر المهاجرين والأنصار والتابعين الأبرار الأخيار إلى يوم القرار ورضوان الله تعالى عليهم أجمعين اللهم اغفر لي ولوالدي ولجميع المؤمنين والمؤمنات إنك سميع مديب الدعوات اللهم عيد المسلمين مسلمين بالإمام العادل والخير والتعاد واتبع سنن السيد الموجودات اللهم انصر من نصر دين محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم واجعلنا منهم واخذ من خذل دين محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ولا تجعلنا منهم عباد الله رحمكم الله إن الله يعمركم بالعدل والإحسان ويتاء إذ القربى وينهى الفحشاء والمنكر والبغض نعيذكم لعلكم تذكرون واذكروا الله يذكركم وادعوه يستجب لكم ولا ذكر الله تعالى عالى وعولى وعز وجل وحم وتم وأكبر عيد مبارك